Hello everyone and welcome to today's lecture on poisoning, assessment, management, and prevention. I'm excited to dive into this topic with all of you and I promise that it won't be a poisonous experience. Jokes aside, understanding how to assess, manage, and prevent poisoning is a critical aspect of your future careers as nurses. Today we'll be discussing the different types of poisoning, nursing diagnoses related to these cases, and your role in providing patient-centered care for affected individuals. So buckle up, grab your antidotes, and let's explore this essential aspect of nursing care. Let's look at the objectives for this presentation. We're going to understand the different types of poisoning, their pathophysiology, and their effects on various body systems. Identify common risk factors for poisoning and discuss strategies for health promotion and disease prevention. Describe the assessment process for patients with suspected poisoning, including recognizing clinical manifestations and utilizing appropriate tests and procedures. Outline the key safety considerations and potential complications in poisoning cases and their importance in nursing care. And finally, discuss the components of patient-centered care for poison patients, including nursing interventions, therapeutic procedures, and medications. Let's examine five key nursing diagnoses related to poisoning, ineffective airway clearance, impaired gas exchange, risk for injury, acute confusion, and ineffective coping. First, let's discuss ineffective airway clearance. Clinical manifestations might include coughing, wheezing, and increased respiratory secretions. We would assess the patient's respiratory rate, lung sounds, and secretions. To help our patients, we might encourage them to cough effectively, use incentive spirometry, or administer bronchodilators if prescribed. The rationale for these interventions is to clear the airway secretions and improve airflow. We would educate patients and families on the importance of maintaining a clear airway and techniques for effective coughing. Next is impaired gas exchange. Clinical manifestations might include dyspnea, tachypnea, cyanosis, and altered mental status. As nurses, we would assess the patient's respiratory rate, oxygen saturation, and mental status. To assist our patients, we might administer supplemental oxygen as needed and place them in a position that promotes optimal lung expansion, such as a high Fowler's position. The rationale for these interventions is to enhance oxygenation and facilitate gas exchange. We would educate patients and their families about the importance of monitoring for signs of respiratory distress and seeking medical attention if needed. Now let's look at risk for injury. Clinical manifestations might vary depending on the nature of the poisoning, but they could include seizures, altered mental status, or respiratory distress. We would assess the patient's level of consciousness vital signs, and potential sources of injury within their environment. <clears throat> to help patients, we might provide a safe environment by removing hazards and instituting seizure precautions if necessary. The rationale for these interventions is to minimize the risk of injury and ensure patient safety. We would teach patients and families about the signs of potential complications and the importance of poison proofing their homes. Moving on to acute confusion. Clinical manifestations may include disorientation, agitation, or memory impairment. We would assess patients' mental status, orientation, and cognitive function. To help patients, we could provide a quiet, calm environment, reorient them frequently, and ensure their safety. The rationale for these interventions is to promote cognitive function and minimize the risk of injury due to confusion. We would educate patients and families on the signs of acute confusion and the importance of seeking help if confusion persists or worsens. Now let's discuss ineffective coping. Clinical manifestations might include anxiety, denial, or maladaptive coping mechanisms. We would assess patients' emotional and mental states, as well as their support systems. To help patients, we could offer emotional support, encourage expression of feelings, and refer them to appropriate mental health resources if needed. The rationale for these interventions is to promote healthy coping strategies and provide emotional support, educating patients and their families on the importance of seeking help for emotional distress and providing them with resources for support is essential. Remember, each patient's situation is unique, so it's crucial to adapt our assessments and interventions to meet their individual needs. 
Now let's look deeper into the pathophysiology of different types of poisonings, their effects on various body systems, and provide examples of common toxic agents. Ingestion is the most common route of poisoning and typically involves the consumption of toxic substances like household cleaning agents, medications, or contaminated food. For example, ingesting ethylene glycol, found in antifreeze, can lead to kidney failure, while consuming poisonous mushrooms, such as Amanita phalloides, can cause severe liver and kidney damage. Inhalation occurs when a person breathes in toxic substances, such as gases, vapors, or aerosols. Examples include carbon monoxide, which binds to hemoglobin in the blood and prevents oxygen from reaching vital organs, or inhaling ammonia, which can cause severe respiratory irritation and potentially lead to respiratory distress. Absorption occurs when a toxic substance comes into contact with the skin or mucous membranes and enters the body. Common examples include pesticides or industrial chemicals like organophosphates, which can cause muscle weakness, seizures, and respiratory distress. Another example is poison ivy, which contains a toxic substance called burishyl, which can cause an itchy rash and skin inflammation. Injection involves the introduction of a toxic agent directly into the body through a puncture or bite. Examples include venomous snake bites, which can lead to tissue damage, blood clotting abnormalities, and potentially fatal systemic reactions, or contaminated needles, which can transmit diseases like HIV or hepatitis. The effects of poisoning on body systems can vary widely depending on the toxic agent involved. For example, poisoning of the central nervous system can result from exposure to toxins like alcohol, opioids, or sedative medications. These substances can suppress the respiratory drive, leading to respiratory arrest or even death. In contrast, neurotoxic substances like lead or mercury can cause cognitive impairment, peripheral neuropathy, and behavioral changes. By understanding the pathophysiology of different types of poisonings and their effects on the body, we can better assess, treat, and educate our patients and their families on the importance of prevention and early intervention. Remember that the effects of poisoning may be acute or chronic, and that some toxins have a cumulative effect on the body over time. It's crucial to consider the patient's history and potential exposures to help identify the source of poisoning and guide appropriate treatment. Let's look further into health promotion and disease prevention when it comes to poisonings. As we've discussed, understanding the pathophysiology of different types of poisonings is essential, but it's also crucial to be proactive in preventing these incidents and minimizing their effects on various body systems. Let's take a, take a closer look at some common risk factors for poisoning. Children, especially toddlers, are at higher risk for accidental ingestion of toxic substances due to their curiosity, limited understanding of danger, and tendency to put objects in their mouths. Older adults may also be at risk due to cognitive decline, poor vision, and difficulties in managing medications. Individuals working in certain industries such as agriculture, chemical manufacturing, cleaning services, or even healthcare may be at an increased risk for exposure to toxic substances or chemicals due to the nature of their work. People with substance use disorders are at risk for poisoning from alcohol, drugs, or other toxic agents, whether through overdose or interactions with other substances. Now that we have a better understanding of the risk factors, let's discuss some key strategies nurses can promote to prevent poisoning incidents. Encourage patients to store medications, household chemicals, and other potentially toxic substances out of the reach of children and vulnerable adults. They should be stored in their original labeled containers and ideally in a locked cabinet. Additionally, teach families the importance of properly disposing of expired or unwanted medications to reduce the risk of accidental ingestion. Educate patients and their families about the importance of having the Poison Control Center's phone number readily available in case of an emergency. In the United States, that number is 1-800-222-1222. Poison Control Centers are staffed with experts who can provide immediate guidance and recommendations in the event of a poisoning. 
Nurses can participate in or promote community awareness campaigns, such as National Poison Prevention Week, to increase public knowledge about poisoning risks and prevention strategies, offer educational materials and resources to patients and families to further reinforce these important messages. As healthcare professionals, it's crucial to remember that poisoning is a medical emergency, and rapid management therapy is essential to minimize the potentially harmful effects of toxic exposure. Nurses play a vital role in not only the assessment and management of poisoning, but also in educating patients and families about the importance of prevention. The assessment process for patients with suspected poisoning involves a few different factors. As nurses, our role is crucial in identifying the type of poison, possible complications, and appropriate interventions. We're going to discuss risk factors, expected findings, and relevant tests and procedures in more detail to give you a comprehensive understanding of what to look for during your assessment. First, let's review those risk factors for poisoning. Age is a significant factor. Remember that young children are at higher risk due to curiosity and lack of understanding, but also the elderly may be at risk due to medication errors or confusion. Occupational exposure to hazardous chemicals, such as in industrial settings or agricultural work, is an also an increased risk of poisoning, and a history of substance abuse, mental health issues, or previous suicide attempts can further elevate the risk, as these individuals might be more likely to intentionally ingest toxic substances. Let's look at the clinical manifestations in more depth. The signs and symptoms of poisoning can vary widely depending on the type and severity of the poisoning. However, some common manifestations include difficulty breathing or respiratory distress, which can be caused by toxins affecting the respiratory system or the central nervous system, altered mental status such as confusion, agitation, drowsiness, or unconsciousness resulting from the toxic effects on the brain, seizures which might be triggered by certain toxins affecting the nervous system, gastrointestinal symptoms like abdominal pain, nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea, which could indicate ingestion of a toxic substance, and skin rashes or burns, which could be a sign of dermal exposure to a caustic or irritating substance. In terms of laboratory tests, we might order a toxicology screen to detect specific toxins or drugs in the patient's blood or urine. Blood gas analysis can help determine acid-base imbalances and oxygenation status. These can be affected by certain poisons. Electrolyte levels such as sodium, potassium, and calcium can be altered by toxins that affect cellular function. Liver and renal function tests can indicate organ damage caused by the toxic agent, while coagulation studies can help identify potential bleeding risks associated with certain toxins. Diagnostic procedures like imaging studies might be needed in specific cases. For instance, an X-ray or CT scan might be necessary when a foreign body, such as a button battery, is suspected to have been ingested. These imaging studies can help determine the location and extent of the foreign body, guiding appropriate management strategies. If you're unfamiliar, a button battery or it's one of those small round batteries, children do tend to swallow them if they get their hands on them. And once inside the body, they can break down and allow that acid to be released into the system. A thorough client history is vital in identifying the toxic agent. Always ask about the circumstances of exposure, such as whether it was accidental or intentional, the substance involved, and the time since exposure. It's also important to determine the type of poison, as management may differ significantly based on the specific toxin. For example, antidotes or specific treatments may be available for some toxins, but not for others. Remember, a snake bite from a venomous snake is a medical emergency. Children ages 1 to 9 are at the highest risk for snake bites because they're often more curious and may not recognize the danger. Make sure to educate families about the importance of snake bite prevention, such as wearing protective clothing and footwear when outdoors, avoiding areas with tall grass or undergrowth, and knowing how to identify venomous snakes that are living in their region. Teach them what to do in case of a snake bite, including immobilizing the affected limb, keeping the bitten area at or below the level of the heart, and seeking immediate medical attention. In summary, when assessing a patient with suspected poisoning, it's crucial to identify risk factors, recognize clinical manifestations, and understand the importance of relevant laboratory tests and diagnostic procedures. Obtaining a detailed client history and identifying the toxic agent are essential in guiding our nursing interventions and ensuring the best possible outcomes for your patient.
Now let's talk about the safety considerations and possible complications related to poisoning. As nurses, we play a crucial role in recognizing and addressing potential hazards to ensure the best possible outcomes for our patients. Understanding these considerations and complications will help you be proactive in preventing adverse events and providing optimal care. One of the most critical safety considerations in poisoning is airway management. Some toxins can cause respiratory distress or failure, either by directly affecting the respiratory system or by depressing the central nervous system. In these cases, maintaining a patent airway is essential. We may need to use interventions such as the head tilt chin lift maneuver, oropharyngeal or nasopharyngeal airways, and even endotracheal intubation or mechanical ventilation in severe cases. Be prepared to administer oxygen as needed and closely monitor the patient's oxygenation and ventilation status. Seizure, pre seizure precautions are also important as certain toxins can trigger seizures. Make sure the patient's environment is safe. Remove any objects that could cause injury during a seizure and ensure that the bed rails are up and padded. Administer anticonvulsant medications as prescribed and be prepared to manage a seizure if it occurs. Monitoring for respiratory distress is vital, especially when the toxic substance affects the respiratory system. Regularly assess the patient's respiratory rate, effort, and breath sounds. Be prepared to provide respiratory support such as oxygen therapy if necessary. Organ damage is another possible complication of poisoning. Depending on the toxin involved, the liver, kidneys, heart, or other organs may be affected. Monitor the patient's vital signs, laboratory test results, and other clinical manifestations to identify early signs of organ dysfunction. Notify the healthcare provider promptly if any concerning findings arise. It's also essential to prevent further exposure to the toxic agent, both for the patient and for the healthcare team. This might involve removing contaminated clothing, washing the affected skin with soap and water, or administering antidotes if available. Be sure to follow appropriate safety precautions, such as wearing personal protective equipment, your PPE, when handling contaminated materials or administering hazardous medications. So remember, safety considerations and possible complications in poisoning cases include airway management, seizure precautions, respiratory distress monitoring, organ damage, and preventing further exposure to toxins. As nurses, it's our responsibility to be vigilant in recognizing and addressing these issues to ensure the safety and well-being of our patients and ourselves. Nursing care for poison patients involves a variety of essential interventions, including respiratory support, circulation monitoring, pain management, and addressing specific complications that arise from different types of poisoning. Providing respiratory support may involve supplying supplemental oxygen, managing the airway through endotracheal intubation or other advanced airway techniques, or initiating mechanical ventilation when respiratory compromise is severe. These actions help ensure adequate oxygenation and ventilation, thus preventing hypoxia and potential organ damage. Monitoring circulation in patients with compromised circulatory function due to excessive perspiration, vomiting, or diarrhea is critical. Restoring fluids with IV therapy, closely monitoring blood pressure, heart rate, and peripheral pulses, and employing cardiac monitoring, including ECG, can help evaluate cardiac function and detect potential arrhythmias. These actions support the maintenance of optimal tissue perfusion and can prevent further complications. Assess for tissue edema every 15 to 30 minutes in patients bitten by venomous snakes or spiders. That is crucial for detecting the progression of the envenomation process. Administering opioid medications for pain management while closely monitoring for potential side effects can help alleviate the patient's discomfort and improve their overall well-being. Frequent neurovascular assessments can aid in detecting any worsening of the patient's condition and prompt appropriate interventions to prevent complications. Therapeutic procedures in the management of poisoning may include gastric lavage, which is most effective if performed within one hour of ingestion as it can help remove the toxic substance from the stomach and reduce absorption. The administration of activated charcoal can help absorb ingested toxins and minimize systemic absorption, therefore, thereby reducing the toxic effect. The syrup of Ipecac is no longer recommended due to its potential to cause more harm than benefit. For patients experiencing seizures, diazepam or other anticonvulsants can be administered as needed to control seizure activity and reduce the risk of injury. 
In cases of heroin or other opiate toxicity, naloxone, Narcan, can be used to reverse the effects, potentially saving the patient's life. In certain situations, dialysis and exchange blood transfusion might be implemented as non-pharmacologic techniques to remove toxic agents and mitigate the risk of organ damage. Patient and family education plays a crucial role in poisoning management, providing comprehensive information on the signs and symptoms of poisoning, the significance of early intervention, and the necessity for follow-up care can empower patients and families to recognize and respond to potential poisoning events. Educating them about safe storage practices for medications and chemicals and informing them about available resources such as poison control centers can help prevent future incidents. Interprofessional care is essential in managing poison patients. Collaborating closely with physicians, pharmacists, and other healthcare team members to develop and implement a suitable care plan ensures that the patient receives well-rounded, evidence-based care. Regular communication, information sharing, and updates enable prompt recognition of changes in the patient's condition and timely adjustments to the care plan. So remember, patient-centered care for poison patients encompasses nursing care, therapeutic procedures, medications, education, and interprofessional collaboration. By addressing the specific needs of each patient and working together as a cohesive team, we can optimize patient outcomes and provide the highest quality of care. So in conclusion, let's recap the key points from our discussion on poisoning and highlight the crucial role nurses play in assessment, management, and prevention. As nurses, it's essential to understand the various types of poisoning, their pathophysiology, and the effects on different body systems. This knowledge is vital for providing optimal care to poison patients. We discussed several nursing diagnoses associated with poisoning and their respective clinical manifestations, assessment criteria, and interventions. Remember that our primary goal is to ensure comprehensive and individualized care to achieve the best possible outcomes. In terms of health promotion and disease prevention, we emphasize the importance of identifying risk factors for poisoning and implementing strategies to prevent incidents. Educating patients and families about safe storage practices, poison control resources, and early intervention can make a significant difference in preventing poisoning cases. Throughout the assessment process, it's vital to recognize risk factors, clinical manifestations, and utilize appropriate tests and procedures. Obtaining a thorough patient history is key to identifying the toxic agent and implementing appropriate interventions. Safety considerations and potential complications should always be at the forefront of our practice. Monitoring for respiratory distress, seizures, and organ damage, as well as ensuring proper airway management are essential to providing safe and effective care. Patient-centered care involves nursing care, therapeutic procedures, medications, and interprofessional collaboration, all tailored to the specific needs of each patient. By addressing these components, we can optimize patient outcomes and provide the highest quality of care. Finally, it's important for us as nurses to stay up to date with the latest guidelines and best practices for managing poison patients. By continually expanding our knowledge and refining our skills, we can better serve our patients and provide the best possible care in these critical situations.